Uh, but I think we go away, the more we learn about them, the more we realise how little we actually know about them and how much more needs to be done for them. We are fortunate today to also have with us uh, Siobhan and Shorsha Plunkett, who are the grandchildren of the Count. And uh, they're also affected niece and nephew of Joseph Plunkett, of course, uh, who was executed in 1916. Uh, Shorsha would now like to come and to say a few words to us also. Thank you. I should just condense this talk into the words of my brother Owen when he was interviewed on his first and only visit to Kilmainham Jail. He was a judge. <laughs> However, it seems like a good idea to flesh that out a bit. He remained a person whose friends remained true to him right through to his old, very old age, and who travelled to long distances during the war to see them see him when they themselves were no spring chickens. My earliest recollections of Grandad and Grandad were when they were living in Fort Elgin Road, which later became the Swiss legation. Forty had plenty of room, a speaking tube from the dining room to the kitchen downstairs, where Lily McNulty ruled. Grandad spent a lot of time at the left of the dining room fireplace, with Grandma in her chair at the other side. You rarely saw one of them without the other. He was getting deafer day by day, but he was very straight and mobile and could easily make room for you on his knees. And there we get into the question of him telling you about the little big drummer and the little drummer. Yes, he did. You had to shout at him, which limited your range of topics. His choice in music was Italian opera, but he, I can remember him beating along to Funicoli Funicola, which he enjoyed thoroughly. My sisters, Maura and Siobhan, were caught when school hours now had an hour and a half of a break for dinner, a national fuel saving directive. We would come back by tram from our centre city schools and eat with our grandparents. Though sometimes Grandad would not be back from the bookstall outside Green's book, Green's book shop in Clare Street. We often saw him there when we were passing in the tram. At dinner, we very much appreciated the siphon of lemonade provided for us. Grandad had Chianti, and Grandma might have had just a little. Snooping around, I found that Grandad was a patron or director of the Royal Hospital for Incurables and of Mercer's Hospital. Grandad's pet project on a personal level was the Academy of Christian Art, centred in 42 Upper Mount Street. He lectured there on occasion, though at last my father had to stand in for him on the subject of the High Crosses of Ireland. He had a strong interest in Oliver Plunkett and had two portraits of him hanging on the wall, along with one of Father Luke Waddy. In 1939, the IRA declared war on England, and some months later, Britain declared war on Germany. The outcome was the internment of our dad, Jack, and our cousin, Colm O'Leary. Jack was ordered to go on hunger strike and taken off it on his 57th day, with only hours to live, if he had kept going. This was a fearful upheaval in the family. After some weeks <coughs> recovery in St. Brickens, Jack was sent by his mother to Glen Hest Hotel to continue the recuperation, and we all went to visit him Grandad and Grandma included for Christmas dinner. He came after that to our house at Owenstown to continue his recovery, a very sick man. The next upheaval was the move to, of everyone, Grandad and Grandma, all of us with Jack and Fiona to Banniscanon. 
Ballinascannon had 104 acres for our dairy herd and a single house large enough for all, which is seen as an economy. Randall started off there in good health, shuffling a bit in his carpet slippers, but no longer so formally dressed. He now favoured a velvet smoking jacket and a pillbox hat to keep out the cold of the unheated house. Yeah, he had the remains of his library along the walls of two large rooms, while my mother's large bookcase was in one of the reception rooms. Grandma was still mobile. I was down the yard playing with a little saw when she came down for a short walk. Saw me there and recounted how she had bought saws and other tools to give to the children of those being locked, looked after in Sandy Cove Castle during the 1913 lockout. She very carefully explained to me, for me to remember, that her motive in bringing the children to the castle had been to save them and definitely not in order to break the strike, as had been alleged. In January 1944, our dad died and Grandma lost the will to live and died in March. Rhonda was not strong enough to go to her funeral. He gravitated to his particular chair in the boudoir, near the log fire, and under the lampshades of, an electric, of electric lights that could not be lit for lack of petrol for the generating plant. His reading, of books, his reading was of books beyond our comprehension. I still remember him laughing and looking up from his book, remarking to us on a disagreement between two eminent saintly writers. We might as well have been looking into a bush. Conversation with him was by pencil and paper. Grandad's feebleness increased slowly and he stopped using the pre jew for the family rosary. He now had the services of a brother of the Order of St. Camillus, and sometimes a priest of the Order. Mass was said a few times a year at the altar in recognition of his standing in the church. Neighbours came then and got their introduction to the great man. Visitors came, though rarely, all the way from Dublin by train. I recall Schkeld, whom my mother knew too, coming in spite of his own age. It was then that I first heard the expression, the uncrowned King of Ireland used about grandeur, though he was too Republican to stand for such a title. Ballinus Gannon was an economic nightmare and had to be sold. My mother and our family moved to Dublin in 1946 and we visited Grander and the others for the rest of the year at Christmas and Easter. Grander and the others left Ballinus Gannon when it was sold. Granda and Jack and Lily McNulty were installed in 42 Upper Mount Street, no longer in use as the Academy of Christian Art. Granda's health had now deteriorated. He was no longer shuffling along to read his books. We were now visitors, not co-residents. But still welcome, particularly for Christmas dinner. Grando was now prone to pneumonia and had little energy and was more and more confined to bed. Medical science came to the rescue and he got treated with the new wonder drug, penicillin. But he was no longer well able to talk and his deafness was about complete. He died and was laid out in the front room of 42 with a queue of people coming up the steps and in to see him in his uniform as a count of the Holy See, Knight Commander of the Holy Sepulchre, the most decent of men. When we visited the Convent of the Blue Nuns in Rome in 1975, he was still remembered by the Order for his work in straightening out the governance of that Order, 
forestalling a looming decision to close them down for their lack of system and failure to achieve their aims. Their vibrancy was restored and they prospered, as many a person born safely in Mount Carmel can vouch for. Siobhan and myself remember him for his smile, which was reflected his love for us all so completely. Grandma's title was hereditary. My mother translated it for me from the Latin document framed on our wall, for fear the form would disappear, which it did. His standing carried with it the right to re have and read books which were on the index. <laughs> A devout and prayerful Catholic, it was he that I first heard, quoting a French cardinal, that any Catholic who is not anti-clerical does not know the history of his religion. <laughs> <laughs> his political outlook remained Republican to the end, and he supported his two remaining sons throughout their conflict with the Free State. Thank you. 